Welcome back vintage camera lovers for another trip down memory stick lane and today is the turn of Sony's Cybershot F828, a high-end prosumer bridge camera launched in 2003 at a price of around a thousand dollars or pounds. I reviewed it for both Mac user and PC advisor magazines when it first came out and just over two decades later I bagged an untested model from eBay for just 43 pounds which sprang into life given a new battery. So join me as I take it for a spin around Brighton 21 years after it was launched and see why it can still do things that most cameras can only dream of. Back in 2003, the F828 built upon its already gadget-packed predecessors to become Sony's most feature-filled Cybershot to date. It boasted a new 8 megapixel sensor with a unique colour filter array, a 7x optical zoom lens with mechanical adjustment, the choice of memory stick or, shock horror, compact flash storage, unlimited VGA video, the chance to shoot in complete darkness and more buttons than you could possibly imagine all squeezed into a twisting L-shaped body inspired by the previous F700 and F500 models. It had also grown substantially in heft and now wore an all black finish, all proving that it was really serious compared to those smaller simpler silver cameras that came before it. And here's why. In the same year, Canon launched the EOS 300D, or Digital Rebel, the first sub $1,000 DSLR. Sure, it lacked the features of a top-end prosumer all-in-one like the F828, and it came with a much shorter kit zoom too, but there was no arguing with the considerably larger sensor inside, coupled with the chance to swap lenses. DSLRs had long been the ticking time bomb for bridge cameras, with many photographers just waiting until they became sufficiently affordable before switching to the kind of camera that they always wanted. That time had arrived. So in many respects, the F828, along with the other bridge cameras launched alongside it, represented the last stand for this category. Sony, Nikon, Minolta, Olympus, and even Canon all launched feature pack models, sporting the same 8 megapixel sensor around the same time, but they all knew they were drinking in the last chance saloon. But equally, they weren't going out without a fight. Sony's F828 was certainly a unique looking camera, clearly inheriting some of the L-shaped design DNA of its predecessors, but bulking up and presenting a much more serious appearance than the previous F717. Like the models before it, the 828 employed a twisting design where you'd rest the substantial lens barrel in your left hand, leaving your right hand to angle the main body up or down, in this case by 70 or 30 degrees, for easier framing at low or high angles. At 925 grams with battery, it was roughly 50% heavier than the previous F717, but that gave it a reassuring heft in your hands. Sony also continued to sensibly position the tripod thread under the main lens barrel and included a second hole for an alignment pin. The body hinge was larger than before with a very satisfying click when returned to the central position. Unlike the fully articulated screens on some rivals, it may not have faced forward for selfies, but in your hands it felt more robust and to me remains one of Sony's design triumphs, especially for waist level shooting. Unless we forget, that budget Canon DSLR screen was firmly fixed in position. Sony also trumped the range of DSLR kit lenses by equipping the F8-8 with a new 7x optical zoom, equivalent to 28 to 200 mil, taking you from respectable wide-angle coverage to mid-telephoto. Just compare that to the meager 28 to 88 mil equivalent 3x range of a typical 18 to 55 DSLR kit zoom. <sighs> Sony's lens barrel dipped in a little bit, then extended a little more as you zoomed from 28 to 200 mil, but crucially delivered this range in a barrel about the same size as a DSLR kit zoom. The aperture was also respectably bright at f2 to 2.8, allowing for some shallow depth of field effects, even if the sensor inside was relatively small. But in turn, the benefit of that small sensor and short actual focal length meant the F828 could also deliver decent macro results, getting as close as 2cm from your subject to capture just 56mm across the frame. That's way better than you'd get with a DSLR kit zoom. In an important change from its predecessors, not to mention most rivals, the F828 also dumped the motorized zoom control in favour of a mechanically linked ring. Like a proper DSLR zoom lens, this allows for very precise adjustments over the focal length without the lurching of many electronic motorized systems. When you're filming video, it may be harder to maintain a constant zoom speed, but it did allow for dramatic crash zooms with a sharp twist of the ring. For composition, the F828 offered a 1.8 inch screen with 134K pixels or a 235K dot electronic viewfinder. 
Eye sensors were a rarity back then, so you'd need to select between the EVF and screen with a switch on the back. Today, the EVF inevitably looks fairly coarse in resolution, but 21 years ago, it was actually one of the more detailed around and could certainly be used for precise manual focusing using the free spinning ring on the barrel. And as an EVF, it also matched what could be done with the main screen with rich multiple information views, a live histogram, menu navigation and image playback, not to mention more accurate coverage, none of which were possible on a DSLR's optical viewfinder. You can still tell the F828's main competition though by the substantial exposure mode dial alone, which turned with satisfying clicks and sported a spring-loaded power collar inherited from the F717. The F828 provided full control over exposures, including an impressive shutter range of 30 seconds to 2,000th of a second and apertures from F2 to F8. A faster 3,200th of a second shutter speed was also available in manual mode, but only when coupled with the minimum FA aperture as they shared the same mechanism. Alongside the mode dial is a handy LCD information screen with an optional backlight. It's actually the first top screen on a Cybershot F model. The F828 also had lots of buttons, five on the side of the lens barrel, six around the screen, and three more by the shutter release. Several were dedicated to settings like the flash or drive mode, the white balance or exposure compensation, and these were adjusted typically by pushing down on the button as you turned the rear thumb dial with a rotating on-screen graphic to confirm the setting. Other settings along with menus were operated with the rear joystick, which I'll show you in just a moment. The F828 was powered by the same NP-FM50 info lithium pack as the 707 and 717 before it, which displays the minutes of power remaining on screen. This charges in camera using the supplied AC L15 power supply. Now like most rechargeable batteries from the period 20 years ago, original packs are unlikely to store any charge today, so if you'd like to get a camera working, you should budget for a replacement pack. I used the same DSTE battery I'd bought for my 707 and 717 reviews, which cost about £15, but you are going to need an original AC L15 AC adapter to charge it in the camera. Luckily, this is also the same as the charger on the 707 and 717, allowing you to share the same accessories. Unsurprisingly, as a Sony camera, the F828 used full-length memory stick cards, the ones that look like chewing gum sticks. And by 2003, this also meant compatibility with the latest Pro versions with faster speeds and larger capacities. I used a 2GB Pro Duo card in an adapter, which worked fine. Both the memory stick and battery are housed in a compartment below the camera. But in a shock move though, Sony also equipped the F828 with a compact flash card compartment on the side of the body, and it would also accommodate thicker Type 2 cards, including the IBM Microdrive. A switch by the door open lever lets you choose between recording on compact flash or memory stick media. CF compatibility makes it much easier to use the F828 today, although a standard mini USB port on the rear of the camera does allow you to use it as a standard USB card reader. Do note that you will need to be using Memory Stick Pro or an IBM Microdrive in order to support the smoothest 30 frames per second video frame rates though. Standard CF or MS cards will be limited to video at 16 frames per second. Alongside the USB port on the rear are the charging port and the 3.5mm AV output jack for slideshows on a TV. There's also a smaller port on the side of the barrel for remote controls or external flash accessories along with a fully featured hot shoe on the top. There's also a pop-up flash, in turn responsible for the slightly unusually shaped head on this camera. The F828 became the first camera to exploit Sony's latest 8 megapixel CCD sensor, matching the 2 3rd inch type size of the earlier 717, but packing in considerably more pixels. Interestingly, it also marked the debut of a new colour filter array, switching the traditional red, green, blue, green Bayer pattern for red, green, blue and emerald, claiming broader and more realistic colours as a result. It also gave the 828 a unique difference from rival models from Canon, Nikon, Olympus and Minolta, which may have shared the same core 8 megapixel Sony sensor, but with more traditional Bayer colour filter arrays. We'll see in a moment what difference that colour filter array makes in practice. Pushing the menu button popped up a list of settings, starting with the ISO sensitivity running between 64 and 800 ISO, with an auto option, which in my tests only seemed to select 64 ISO. Here's a shot taken in low light at 64 ISO before zooming in for a closer look and now running through the ISO range. The lowest values are nice and clean, but as you approach the higher ISOs, detail is gradually lost to noise and processing. This was where the larger sensor of a DSLR would take a lead, not to mention support higher sensitivities. 
Next there was the image resolution with the maximum 8 megapixels in the native 4x3 shape or cropped into a wider 3x2 shape if you prefer, followed by 5, 3 or 1 megapixel options all in 4x3. Now 8 megapixels doesn't sound like a great deal today but it was in fact industry leading at this price at the time and revealingly more than the 6 megapixels of Canon's entry level DSLR and if you could keep the sensitivity low on the Sony it could actually out resolve that Canon but again as the ISO increased a DSLR would have the advantage. JPEGs were recorded with either fine or standard compression with best quality files measuring around 3.5 megabytes each. From the next menu, you could select two alternative formats, including TIFF and making its debut on a Cybershot camera, RAW. TIFF and RAW files measured around 17 and 24 megabytes respectively, with both tying up the camera for up to 14 seconds as they're recorded to your card. Selecting RAW also recorded a duplicate JPEG file, effectively making it a RAW plus JPEG mode. Next up were three picture effects, negative art, sepia and solarize, but sadly still no monochrome option. The next menu intriguingly offered standard or real color modes, more about which in a moment, followed by minor adjustments to saturation, contrast and sharpness. But again, what was that color mode all about? Here's a shot I took with the F828 in its standard color mode. As you'll also notice on my other photos coming up, it's quite punchy with fairly bold contrast and saturation. Now here's one taken with the real mode, which appears a little more subdued, like the parameters have just been turned down a bit. Sony suggested that real mode was better for subsequent processing on your computer, and I believe it used the SYCC color space versus the more common sRGB. But regardless, when I look at my photos from the camera, I'm not sure I'm seeing any benefit to its unique color filter array. In fact, if anything, the biggest impact that this seemed to have during my tests was to RAW files. To illustrate what I'm talking about, here's that JPEG again in the standard color mode, followed by a RAW file processed without any adjustment in a modern version of Adobe Camera Raw, where you can see it suffers from a pretty undesirable tint. The same thing happens to RAW files recorded in the real color mode. Certainly Adobe software knows what camera it's dealing with, you can see it stated here, correctly identifying the SRF file as coming from the 828, but either these RAW files are a bit odd, or it doesn't seem to know how to deal with them. Maybe it's the RGBE color filter array. But if you're choosing this camera for raw support, do bear in mind that you'll probably need to do some tweaking to get it looking normal first, at least with modern software. Alternatively, you may have more luck tracking down an old version of Sony's own image data converter software. Moving on to video, the F828 could record 640x480, that's VGA resolution, at up to 30 frames per second, given a fast enough memory card. Slower cards were again limited to 16 frames per second, and there was also a smaller 160 by 112 option at 8 frames per second. Clips were limited only by memory, and also included audio, and do remember that back in 2003, video on a DSLR was still 5 years away. I'll show you some examples in just a moment, but first I wanted to mention one of the most unique features of the F828, the ability to compose and shoot in complete darkness. These night shot and night framing modes were inherited from the F700 models and a selection of camcorders before them, and they all work in a similar way. They exploit the fact that most camera sensors can also record infrared light, but they generally filter it out for normal use. Sony's night modes temporarily removed this blocking filter to allow the sensor to see both visible and infrared light. Then they simply shone infrared LEDs like torches to illuminate a nearby subject without ever being visible to our eyes. Sony then added a green tint to make them look like military night vision, and bingo, you could live out your eerie ghost-busting fantasy in the dark. Now the feature did earn some notoriety on early models with stories of seeing through clothes, something that I never experienced, but Sony did gradually hobble its flexibility and phase it out, with the F828 being the last model to have it, at least in this series. But the chance to switch a camera between visible light and full spectrum without permanently modifying it is an intriguing capability, especially when it was later discovered that you could actually move this blocking filter out of the way by placing a powerful magnet near the camera's lens. This would bypass the night shot mode with its auto settings, high sensitivity and green tint, and just let you shoot full spectrum in all of the normal modes using the best quality settings. Then when you were done, just turn the camera off and on again, and you're back to the normal colours. This so-called magnet hack did appear to work on the 707 and 717, but sadly in my experience, neither camera could subsequently focus on distant landscapes once that blocking filter had been moved. 
However, I can confirm that the FA-208 will focus to infinity onto distant subjects after the magnet hack and at any focal length on the zoom too. To make it work, take a strong magnet and place it near to the accessory port on the underside of the lens barrel. You may need to try both sides of the magnet and move it around a bit to find the right spot. But once you hit the jackpot, you'll hear the click of the blocking filter being moved aside and be greeted by a red tinted full spectrum image. If you prefer to shoot in pure infrared light, simply screw on an infrared filter that blocks visible light. I used a Hoya R72 infrared filter in the 58mm size. Now what you're seeing is a view in infrared light alone. The colours look strange here, but converting them to black and white can be very effective. So here's a view that I took in normal visible light with the F828 before switching to one in full spectrum using the magnet hack. And now here's how it looks in infrared only after screwing on an R72 filter. And finally, here's this view turned to black and white for the maximum impact. Infrared photos can look great with green foliage which glows brighter than under visible light. So here's another view, first in visible light, then in full spectrum, next in infrared light only, and now with that version converted to black and white with a boost in contrast. Notice how the greenery looks white here, almost like snow, but this was taken on a warm, sunny spring day. Once again, the magnet hack allows the F828 to take full spectrum images or infrared with a filter in any mode at the base sensitivity for the best quality. You've got full control over exposure and even the chance to shoot in RAW if you like. You can even film videos in full spectrum or filtered infrared light for special effects, perhaps to recreate those Harkonnen gladiator scenes in Dune Part 2, or maybe just keep it in a nice park. Right, I'm done now with the features, so before my final verdict, here's my customary slideshow of photos taken with the F828 around Brighton. See you in a minute. You can also film video at up to 640 by 480 that's VGA resolution at up to 30 frames per second as well if you've got a fast enough memory card. Let's check out some more clips. The F828 represented the pinnacle of Sony's innovative Cybershot F series, the fifth and what would become the final model in a series that started with the F505 back in 1999. Four years of evolution saw the cunning L-shaped design with its twisting body steadily grow in size, gain a viewfinder, increase its resolution and even shoot in the dark. The F828 may have suffered from more purple fringing and electronic noise than out of light, but the pros far outweighed the cons. This was an overwhelmingly feature-packed camera with a space-age look, 
But the elephant in the room was Canon's first sub $1,000 DSLR. Sure, the EOS 300D or Digital Rebel was primitive in features, but for the same money, you were getting a considerably larger sensor and the chance to swap lenses or, or even use your old ones from a film camera. Even if the 300D or Rebel wasn't quite there yet for many of us, the writing was on the wall for prosumer bridge cameras like the Cybershot F series. In the following years, super zoom cameras took over what remained of a decreasing prosumer camera market, although there were occasional harks back to a more classic period. Sony's Cybershot R1, for example, is arguably a reimagined F828 with an APS-C sensor. But while the demise of prosumer cameras was an inevitable time bomb waiting for DSLRs to become affordable, they coexisted for long enough for what was initially considered second best to actually become more compelling in many respects. Just compare the F828 against the Canon DSLR kit in 2003. For the same money, the Sony gave you a much longer zoom range, a twisting body for easier composition, and the chance to record video or shoot in darkness. And it looked way cooler too. But what really makes the F828 attractive two decades on was the discovery of how easily it could become a full spectrum or infrared camera without permanent modifications. Now this was never an intentional feature, but it works so well you wish it were possible on modern cameras, albeit trickier due to their larger sensors and their larger corresponding filters. This is why I celebrate the F828 as one of the best vintage digital cameras out there today. Some may see it as a failure due to it being the last of its kind, not to mention the first and only model to use that RGB filter array, but the irony is it's actually become one of the most attractive models of the period, so snap one up while you can. And that's it for another retro review, I hope you enjoyed it. As always, I'd love to hear your memories about your first digital cameras, whether it was a Sony Cybershot or a completely different brand. And if you'd like me to make more of these videos, please do consider giving my channel a follow and checking out my other vintage reviews. It really does help my channel grow and I greatly appreciate your support. Right, I'd better get on now with the Cybershot R1. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.